this is the Chris Allen MMA show. Today I'm being joined by one of the pioneers, the veterans of UK MMA. He's been at it now for 14 years, I think it is now. Please correct me if I'm wrong. You know, yeah. it's Lee, the butcher Chadwick. Hello, my friend. How are you doing? Right. Nice to speak to you, mate. Good speaking to yeah. you. Yeah, it's great actually speak to you. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, Lee. I'm not saying because you're on here. Um, I've been watching MMA in the UK for quite a long time, mate. So I have been watching you coming up through, especially through when we were in the, was it in the Bama stages? Then we were at Cage Warriors. And yeah, it's been a bit of a journey. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's been a big journey. And yeah, 14 years. It's been 14 good years. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy where I finally got to with Bellator. Yeah, mate. I said you fight. You said you fought in huge organisations, and now obviously you're 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 14 years in, and you're fighting at one of the biggest organisations in the world. You know, like looking back at you, you see a lot of people who have been doing what you've been doing for this long, and they're they're struggling. But you seem to be quite dominating at the moment. You're doing quite well out there. Like, obviously, your last fight was such it was a very like razor close split decision sort of thing. So. I don't count split decisions. I just count that as needing to be a rematch, you know. But um, yeah. no, you've got you got, you got to be happy by well, how it's going so far. Yeah, definitely. And, like, I, I moved from after the Fabian Edwards fight. Um, I, I struggled to make weight for that fight, and I wasn't myself. So I decided, me and my team decided to step up to light heavyweight after that. Because I've been at middleweight, for, as you say, for, like, 13 years. So, um my body's getting stronger and heavier and, you know, weight cutting's getting more difficult. So, yeah, the Fabian Edwards give me a fight, give me a bit of a wake-up call and made me realise it's time to step it up. Because I was cutting down from 100 kilo to get to 84. And you got and to be, and to be fair to you as well, mate, um, it's not as if you look bad in there against Fabian. You took one of the top guys at the moment, you know, pushing for titles to a decision in your first ever bout with Benetton. Like, that, that's got to be Yeah, fantastic. that's true. So, and he's a young prospect, so it was a, it was like it was a big test for both of us for me to go against a, a, a top prospect um, and him to go up against a veteran that's been like in in the top rankings for so many years. So um, it was good for both of us. Um, I just wish I was more. I wasn't the way I was. Uh, like I didn't show me potential in that fight. The weight cut was bad. My mental state was not great. I was just in robotic mode in that fight. So I'm happy with how it went. It went the distance. And that was just me being in autopilot. There was no way um, I didn't use my fight IQ or I, I just wasn't myself in that fight. And I put it down to um, a few stresses I had in the background, but mainly the heavy weight cut just took it out of me. And I'm surprised I took those weight cuts after such a heavy weight cut. Um, head, head kick, sorry. So, you know, the head kicks he caught me with, they were yeah, right but, on the spot. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm happy with that because it shows no matter what state I'm in, I can take a shot. Um, um, you know, I haven't been KO'd yet, so it's a good good thing. Yeah, you beat me to that. I was going to say, never been knocked out, nothing like that before. You know, it just, it's, it's just it's just the British way, mate. You know, it's, it's, you, it's, you, north, it's you guys up north, man. You're just a lot tougher than some of us a lot down here. You know, I think, <laughs> I think, I think that's what it is. <laughs> So was so obviously then your next fight. Um, I was at your next fight, which was good. Uh, was at Bellator Birmingham, and then obviously you fought another incredibly tough opponent in James Mulher. I can never say his name properly. Mulheron, whatever it is. That's uh, yeah, Mulheron. So how did you feel going into that one then, preparation-wise, um, uh, compared to your previous fight? Um, a lot better. Um, obviously, I needed time to adjust to the weight, but um, it was just great not having to cut. cut much weight. Um, my best can go um, because of the extra weight allowance. I was able to feel energised in the fight. Um, and to be honest with James Mullen, he's, he's a banger. Everyone knows him. I've watched him throughout my career. I've always liked him. Um, and he's, he's got really good footwork. He, he, he bounces around like a lightweight. And is a heavy. Well, he used to be a heavyweight. So, and he can back. He, he just keeps punching. He just keeps yeah. punching from start to finish. So the, my idea was to grab hold of him every time he got in the brawl, pin him to the cage, wear him down a bit, come off, a few combos, pin him to the cage. And to be honest, I thought I'd wear him down and he just keeps going. He's like a Jordan's album. That guy's a machine, mate. I was going to say, like I said, net, didn't exactly get an easy start in Bellator. I know you don't want the easy fights, but you definitely didn't have an easy bout the second time round either. Um, <laughs> no, I said, I'm not I getting said, given no favours at all. Um, and I never have done. Cage Warriors, Bama, 
and Bellator now, they, they've all through the best at me all the time. And as far as I'm concerned, you're only better than the people you beat and as yep. good as the people you've faced. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly being tested. And, you know, my money's not made easy, but it's a lot more, it feels a lot better when you do make it the hard way rather than the easy way. Well, anyone who has Niels Van Nord on their on their record, mate, is fair play in my eyes, mate. That geezer's tough, you know. Niels, he's still yeah. going now, and I know, um, he's that... still going. He still wants it. He wants a trilogy. He wants a... <laughs> What happened in? The... He... Or, oh, do you know, what? I didn't know what happened in the first first time you met. I don't didn't realise. I I just moved gyms and I fought at light heavyweight, um, and that was years ago when I was a middleweight, and I fought him at light heavyweight, and it went the distance, and I got beat on points. Um, and I, I'd only been with ASW, um, my coach and mentor now, who I've been with for eight years, I'd only been with them for two months. So we had no time to adjust or prepare. It was just about getting super fit and getting in there and fighting with what I already had. And then my coach, we come away from that. Um, and I won seven fights, or six or seven fights in a row. Won Dennis and Sutherland for the British title. I won Valentino Petescu. I beat yeah. Matt Howard. I beat all them with ASW. And then I come back and had a rematch for the world title with Nils Van Nord. And it showed the difference in level I'd stepped up because I was able to finish him in the second round. Yeah, I was going to say, you've taken on some tough people back in your, but so I'll say back in the day. I'm not trying to make it sound old or anything like that. We're sitting right. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, getting to that point now where it is back in the day. I'm looking at all my old videos and I'm thinking, wow, I look like a completely different person there than I do now. Just looks, never mind fight style. My fight style's just slowly um, perfected over time. Like, um, I've still got a similar style, but it's a bit more technical and a bit more neater and it's a bit more natural rather yeah. than I was having to force me wrestling with me conditioning and force me punches without me footwork. Now I'm starting to put it all together and slowly build myself as the fighter I want to be. That's it. And I said you could just look at your you just look at your career you've had, you know, and it's um you've definitely been there, done that, bought the t shirt sort of thing, you know what I mean? And um I said and what what amazes me is back in two thousand and six when you first started, you know, MMA was very unknown in the UK market. It was very unknown in most places, to be honest with you. So did you struggle to find like like opponents and things early on in the in the game, like 2006? Um, not really, because I'd, I I was one of them. I'd fight anyone anywhere. And at, at the beginning, like um, I got I got my first pro fight was against um, it was stupid. It was against Carla Musu, and I just got through in the deep end. I got a phone call said, "Do you want to fight?" I, I'd only had two three semi pro fights, and I, back in them days, semi-pro was like yeah, headshots and amateur was no headshots. Yeah, yeah I remember. Um, so I went from semi-pro. I didn't have no... I went from three fights to semi-pro straight to pro because I didn't like the rules. Um, and I liked elbows and headshots on the floor. But I, I, ju- I took a few fights that I shouldn't have because I'd fight anyone. Didn't have a team to sort of like make decisions for me. I was just tre- making decisions as a warrior. Train hard, I'll get in with anyone with two arms and two legs. And, you know, that's why my um, record is as it is. If, if I had someone to guard me a bit better, I'm sure it would be a hell of a lot better. Because th- th- there's even been quite a few fights that I've lost that I shouldn't have lost uh, on different organisations, which I'm not, not going to name. Like, there's about three or four fights that I should have won that have gone the other way because I've been in the hometown. And that's the MMA politics, isn't it? Sometimes yeah, if you're in people's backyards, you've got to overcome um, adversity and stuff like that. Yeah, man. Well, I said I'm, that is definitely right. And I do remember the days of you before the beard as well. You know, I do remember those old <laughs> yeah. days, you know, the good old days. Do you know, one, one, one fight, or well, there's a couple of fights I'll never forget. This is, uh, the problem is I always forget the name of the guy you fought. I think it was Manzolo in Cage Warriors where I think yeah. you took him down or hit you down. You just switched to a, was it a leg lock or an ankle lock like, just immediately? Was that the right fight yeah. I'm thinking of? That was incredible. Yeah, that, yeah. that, that transition, was, man, yeah. He, he went for the leg lock on me. And then um, I remember the commentator saying, oh, he's out the leg lock. And then um, oh, he doesn't get up in time. But what it looks like, it looks like I'm trying to get up. How i done it is I went to get up and I let him come on top of me because I wanted him to step his leg up. 
and give me that window for the leg lock back. Because when he went for the heel, the leg lock on me, he had his teammates in my corner looking at me, and I was strapping me ankle up. I couldn't walk properly in that fight. I had to take him down. I like to stand and bang, but that fight, I thought I would have to shoot because yeah. my foot was too bad. I was limping, but I didn't want to pull out the fight because I knew after that fight I was going for the world title. So I went in with a sore ankle, and the first thing he done on the ground was try and pull that leg off. He grabbed me sore ankle. You can see it in the fight. I got strapped on. He grabbed it and just tried to whip a straight leg lock on, and I thought, you, you twat. <laughs> you, you, you know what you're thinking I'm going to tap for, for the sore ankle you've got another thing coming so after that I'm really good with leg lock so after that I thought now I'm going to show you how it's done so I, I, I escaped it I sat on my back I let him pop his leg up and then I threw my leg through for my leg lock heel hook sorry and then yeah I was made up with that because it showed a different style to my fight game yeah, because it's when you transition to it I thought I've never I'm, don't get me wrong I'm not a black belt myself or anything like that but I've never seen the way you transitioned to it was great. It just came out of nowhere. It's as if you almost like, as you said, you went to get up, but didn't and just it got him on top of you. And I, I, to me, I always remember that submission because back when I was watching then, I was like, I wish us UKers, you know, we could be a bit better at wrestling and jiu-jitsu, you know, catch up with these Brazilians and all this stuff. And then then you whip out something like that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my ground game is really good. Um, I, I, as you know, it's the, it get, grappling in MMA is completely different. Um, once you get punched in the face, it's very hard to grapple. It's a bit, it, it's a different type of different style of grappling. Um, in the gym, I grapple every day. That's my main forte on the ground with black belts. Um, and you know, I get I get black belts in that submission all the time. Heel hooks are my main, um, my main one of my main weapons, should I say? Um, it used to be all the chokes, dash, dash chokes, guillotine, rear naked. They were my forte years ago. Um, but that, yeah, the last the last five or six years, I've been doing a lot of leg locks and a lot of black belt moves. You know, as you step up, yeah. I'm a I'm a purple belt graded, but um, I'm black belt level. I can go with black belt all day on the ground. So I'm trying to show that a bit more in me fighting. And in the future, I want to show it more. I want to get some knockouts, but I also want to get some takedowns and show off me um, grappling that I do day in day out. Because I grapple for two hours every morning, non-stop, with all top guys. So, Come and on. that's without me weights, me running, me pads. And st- I train for four or five hours a day, um, five or six days a week, usually. So, where did you go? Because obviously, wrestling was not as well known in the UK back in like two, early 2000s sort of thing. Were you limited to where you could go? Or did you luckily find somewhere, you know, to really push your skill of wrestling and jiu-jitsu and stuff like that? Well... Where I train with Darren Morris, um, he, he, he's, he's a diamond in the rough. Um, if you know him, you know how good he is. And if you don't know him, it's just because he's not out there. Um, but he, he, he's brilliant. The last time he's been, and I can say this hand on heart, the last person to submit him was about 25 years ago. And it was um, Hoist Gracie. Oh, well, you can let him off for that one. <laughs> yeah, and not only that, before Hoist Gracie got him, it took him 20 minutes, and he nearly got Hoist Gracie in, in an armbar. Hoist Gracie managed to get out of it, and then he always reversed it. So um, he's a really high-level grappler, and not to mention he's 17 stone. He's 50 years old, but he's 17 stone. Um, he, he does all my fight camps with me. He's one of my main sparring partners. He wrestles with me. He's a black belt in judo. He's a black belt in BJJ. He's a, a submission wrestling specialist. He, he fought on Max years ago before the Cajun ring was out, um, when it was just Valley Tudo. He's done Russian Sambo. He, yeah, he's man. a really underrated... No one knows about him, but when you're getting trained by him, you realise you're really getting trained by the right man. He suits my style because I'm a rest, submission wrestler, strong, um, strong condition guy. That's the sort of style he works with me. We do a lot of judo. We work on our judo trips takedowns, cage work, um, MMA boxing, um, like uh, how to use your wrestling with your hands and how to use your hands with your wrestling. And yeah, that's that's what he works with me all the time. So um, the ground game is his main forte. So how, we stem from that. We build the roots on the ground and build upwards. How, how long have you been with him now? Um, eight, about eight years, eight or nine years. I've knew him for a lot longer. Um, but yeah, eight or nine years I've been with him um, on a daily basis, constantly training. Um, and before that, I was with Carl Bond. 
okay. you know, Darren Stills and Terry yeah, Etams, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Jim, I, I, I was with Carl Bond when um, Terry Etam and Mark Scanlon and all them were coming yeah. through and Paul, Paul Sass and stuff like that. So we was all together years ago. I was with Carl Bond for seven years and then I've been yeah, with um, RSW for the rest. Yeah, Terry and Paul were um, unbelievable jiu-jitsu fighters as well, man. You know, especially on the UK scene. Um, when Paul came into the U, was it? Did he go? He did get to the UFC, didn't he? I remember rightly, and he was just submitting yeah. everyone left, right, and centre. And I, this is the first time he had a British guy come in and do that sort of thing to people, you know, which was which was great <laughs> to see. So that's nice. Then, so from that early on, you've always got that level of training from the early stages in your career, like going forward, sort of things. But before you even started your career in this, did you have any? Like, let's say growing up, for example, the whole background of it all. Like, first of all, what, what got you into combat sports? What made you sit there and be watching something on telly and went, do you know what, I'm going to do that? Do you know what? My first, um, first time I watched it was in Liverpool Olympia. Um, and it was Terry Etham fighting and Paul Cahoon. Um, do you remember Paul Cahoon? He fought Melbourne Manoff in yeah, 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 yeah. Olympia. Yeah, well, um, yeah. He's a mate of mine, Paul. And um, yeah, I've seen the show in um, the Liverpool Olympia and just thought, oh my God, this is brilliant. Um, I've been doing kickboxing anyway and I thought, oh, I need to start doing a bit of this. I really loved it. So how long were you doing kickboxing for before that? And was that like a professional level as well? Um, it, yeah, kickboxing, yeah. I had about, um, had about six or seven K1 fights. Um, I was doing that for a couple of years before I went to Carl Bond. Um, so, yeah, I, I wrestled when I was 11, actually. I'd done a bit of Greco wrestling, and I had a, I, I done three, three like, competition fights in Greco oh. wrestling when I was 11 years old, but then I stopped it. And then years later, I went on to um, kickboxing, and, and then I went back to, when I went to um, Carl Bond, started the BJJ again. Um, but, yeah, so I've got a background in wrestling, I'd done it for a couple of years when I was a kid. Nice way. I didn't realise that. I said, it's very rare you hear that, you know, especially people from the UK at that sort of age, you know, as well, getting the wrestling training. And obviously, these kids are lucky now coming into the gym because they're getting to learn MMA as a whole now. The, the sport's evolving and they can join it while it's evolved and evolving still, you know. And, yeah. you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're the new breed coming through. They get to learn it as a whole. But how do you see that? Do you, do you find that learning as a whole is better for these guys now opposed to learning the individual disciplines? Yes, um... I believe that MMA is a, it's a martial art of its own now. Uh, mixed martial art is a martial art of its own. Uh, yeah. Because years ago when it started, it was like the best karate fighter versus the best wrestler and yeah. the best CJJ fighter versus the best um, Thai boxer. And that's how it used to be. And then obviously people started clicking on. I know, I'll do that and that. And then I've got an advantage over him because, yeah. <laughs> because I can take him down or stand up. So I like, that's it. Yeah. It, it, it was obvious it was going to evolve like that. Yeah, but it was like it's like the early UFCs where you got the ring girls walking around with the instead of round one, it's like boxer sumo. There was a yeah. it was a sumo, wasn't there? Doing sumo yeah. and boxing. Who's going to win this one? I think the sumo wrestler got kicked straight in the face, but um, his teeth ended up <laughs> in the second row. You know, but, um, but that's it. There's those yeah, old days. I've still I've still got them on DVD, mate. Sitting in the front room, mate. You know, they're, yeah, they're classics. Like Frank Shamrock and Hoist Gracie fighting and stuff like that. Pushing his gay and Shamrock and his wrestling shorts and boots. <laughs> oh, no. All, all the conspiracy around the boots when Hoist... Did you hear about that when Hoist obviously made him take his boots off for the second time they fought or something? Because um, there's a big article on it, actually. There's a whole thing about how the Gracies, you know, set UFC 1 up. Well, they did in a way because they wanted to promote jiu-jitsu into the world, which I appreciate, you know. But they apparently yeah. they wanted Ken Shamrock to take his shoes off because, um, I don't know, just help... Because obviously he used them for his grip for wrestling. But they weren't obviously they weren't impressed with that. So he was slipping and sliding everywhere, and he lost. And there was such uproar about that afterwards. It's like a four pack <laughs> spread on it. Yeah, but yeah, the end I, of the day, I, mate, I, I have actually um, I've met Hoyce Gracie before. Actually, that's probably the best moments of my life. To be not gonna lie to you, you know what I mean. But um, at one of the, at the Bellator, because he's he's quite involved with Bellator, isn't he, Hoyce Gracie? Yeah, he is. He's a bit of a Bellator face, isn't he? I have seen him in the crowd quite a lot, and stuff like that he's like a, um, I think Bellator always bring them on as a guest don't they yeah, yeah I think he's holding a seminar under the Bellator banner as well soon as well a jiu-jitsu seminar coming well whatever that's going to be yeah oh brilliant but 
what what and also you would say you were wrestling which i think is amazing at such a young age you know you rarely hear that sort of thing most people say i was playing football in the field my old man but uh, and um, so when, when you went back to um training ground again like how was that transition from doing k1 for that long was it almost like riding a bike again you know going back to the groundwork yeah because i was always strong so um at, at the beginning it was just all about using his strength and fitness and youth so i was able to overpower people with better technique um, than me so that's for a lot for a, quite a few years that's how that's how i was able to come on top of people with my strength because i have got natural strength i don't need to train it um you know i could i could not do weights for 12 months and then i get on a bench bench and bench press 150 160 kilo naturally um with no training and deadlifts 220 plus so i've 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 always had natural strength. That's been my main thing. So everything's been based behind that. Uh, my shots are powerful uh, because of my strength and my weight, my, my body weight, um, and how I throw my body. So yeah, that, I think you've got to in MMA, you've got to realise you've got to find your good points um, and not stop training, but training them, but supplement them. Um, and with me, I know it's my strength. I know I can keep going. So you know. I know I can grab people and I can brawl and I can I can get into a dog fight and keep going. So you just gotta you've gotta play on your strengths and stuff like that. So what what I like as well with your career is um you don't like to stay quiet for too long. So even after your last Bellator or no previous one, you know, you're you're straight into grapple fest doing things like that as well. Um you just won your last yeah. grapple fest fight, if I remember rightly as well. Um I did. So what what made you first of all, were Bellator happy for you to do that sort of stuff in between fights? Yeah, that's the good thing about Bellator, and that's why I like it. Um, you can do your own stuff outside the, the cage. They don't hold you back as much as the UFC. Um, you know, the UFC is an amazing organization, but so is Bellator, and Be- Bellator like a lot less strict with stuff like that, which is what I like because I like to keep busy, and I don't want to. I, w- I don't want to be a guy that fights once or twice a year. Um, I want to fight as much as I can. Like four fights a year is perfect for me. So when I'm not fighting, I throw myself into grappling comps. I always need that I am com- competition um, because otherwise I just uh, I get moody. I get moody <laughs> because I need I always need a goal. So after one goal is finished, I find the next. So if it's not a fight coming up soon, then it's got to be a grapple comp in between to keep me feeling um, like I, I'm pushing myself. To stay in competition mode, sort of thing, like constant training. Yeah, camp. well. Well, after, after I won the Grapple Fest, I also thought on, you know, it's been on social media, um, a grappling um, organisation called King of the North. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but I went down and I, I took that on 24 hours notice. I phoned up and said, listen, um, I fancy jumping in. Is there any place for me? And he went, yeah, go on. They just let me in. Um, and I went in gay, paper belt gay, and then I went in no gay, and then I went in all the absolutes. So I had like eight fights. Um, and I won, won I, I lost one but won the rest so I won seven of them, I won all the gold medals I won like four gold medals and two championship rings um, in nice. both categories in absolute gay and no gay and it, yeah, just uh, in all four competitions I won, I won all the top top competitions so it's nice to keep busy like that and get that feeling and that buzz uh, in between fights and not only that, um, just walking out onto the mat, competitions, the same feeling, whether you're in the cage in front of thousands of people or on the mat in front of 50 people, it just feels exactly the same. How did it feel when you made that first walk down um, at Benetton, Birmingham, um, at Benetton, Newcastle? Sorry, because obviously that's a big, a big event, big arena. I know you've been fighting cage warriors before, but you know the spectacle Benetton do put on a very good show as well. And um, how did it feel just like you're stepping in the office again? Um, well, I'd come off winning in the Echo Arena for the world title um, when I won the world title. So that was a really big um, big arena and I had all the crowd behind me because it was in Liverpool, so that was brilliant. So that gave me a good step into like going into mainline um, fighting. Um, but yeah, um, the Bellator, it, it's a bit daunting at first because you hit the big show that you wanted for so long. And then you think, shit, I'm here now. Now I've got to turn it on and show people that I deserve to be here. 
So yeah, yeah, you, you've always got that first first time jitters, but then after that, you settle into it. After the James Mullenham fight, I thought I felt good after that fight, and then I felt like I found myself a bit then. And then when I went on to the Carl Moore fights, I was more than ready, and I felt at one of my best. It was it was a good. I feel like the Carl Moore fight was one of my better performances because I was using my footwork good because he was trying to stick and move like everyone else does on me, but I was able to hunt him down trap him off and catch him at the cage every time so I felt like I was doing a lot of good work in that cage um, I caught him in the opening bell, I don't know if you've seen it but yeah, I yeah, caught yeah. him with a with a, with a overhand right um, and it was just a it was a knee tap bang so it's like look at his legs, bang catch him in the face, I caught him with that so you know, and there was a few little brawls that come off better my way so yeah, apart from uh, the decision, I I enjoyed that fight, really did. Brought out, it, it gave me a good test. I got the full, like like I spent in one year, 45 minutes inside the Bellator cage because I went yeah, the right. distance three times. So although I didn't get no finishes, at least um, I got the, ring, the cage experience on the big show. Yeah. 45 minutes in a cage is no joke. No, mate, not so well. I said I did watch that last fight. I was lucky to be sitting in the media row that day. Actually, I was watching it from there. And um, when I was watching you fight, I was like, "Ah, oh, they're not going to bring him out the back now." What a pain in the ass that is! I was hoping to chat to him. <laughs> 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 not that I'm being selfish. I know. I know. He, he, do you know what? Like the, the decision, one of the judges give it a um, what is it? Forty. 40-27 or something no, no, like that. No, 30, 30, where one of them gave it a 30-27 and we were all sitting there like, 30-27? Yeah, that's that's like... bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. To be honest, when you're fighting in someone's backyard, unless you take unless you take them out, you've got to be prepared for the worst every time. And that's the problem. I'm willing to fight. I want to travel the world. So I, the future is going to be me going in other people's backyards and, um, and, and taking it to them. But I'm just going to have to get a, a bit more work on my game a bit harder and I'm going to have to take them out. I'm going to use, have to step it up a bit more to make sure it doesn't go the distance. And st- if it does go the distance, it's been... I've battered them. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So it, just, it just makes me up my game. And, you know, I don't want to win easy fights. Um, I, d- I don't want to win easy fights because I don't feel great after them. I want to get in with someone who I don't know whether I'm going to beat and beat them. That's you know always have that confidence that you're better than them. But I wanna, I want that test every time. I want to be fighting the best. I want to prove myself against the best. You know, and at the end of the day, if I've been beat, it's been by a split decision or points. You know what I mean? It's you know no one's knocked me out. No one's submitted me. No one. They, you know. I not bad for not, not, not bad man. Not bad for 14 year career. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah man. Well that's it, and you know I, I, at the minute like people are. People are starting, like, a few people have said to me, when do you want to fight still? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just getting started. Um, I'm still learning. I'm still I, I'm still a baby in my mind because I'm still, every fight, I'm getting better. Now, once you start going on decline, that's when you start looking at the drawing board. But at the minute, I've got so much to learn. I know there's a lot that I do in training that I'm not doing in the cage yet. And until all that's unleashed in the cage and I'm fighting to my best, I'm not going to be satisfied. Win, lose, or draw. Even if, even if I'm smashing people, I, I still need to, I've got a lot more game to bring. Um, there's so much that I haven't shown yet. And that's why I know I've got a, long, a lot longer, a lot many years left, because I'm still, the only things that come out in the cage is the natural stuff. Now, they've got to come be natural for years before you start using them in the cage. So the stuff I learned years ago is still yet to come out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, man. So, well, Brad, Brandy Couture retired at 49, I think. So you're still you're already halfway through your career, man. Do you know what I mean? You've got 14 years left. Yeah, I want another 15 years, mate. I'll be made up. Like I say, as long as I'm walking and I can swing my arms, I'm, I'm getting in there. And as long as I'm not getting embarrassed, you know, if there's a time for the fighter to turn it in. But, you know, until, um, until I, I get to the top and start declining again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even looking at that. I've, I, I think it's going to take me a few years to get where to where I need to be. Still, um, I do believe that because of the last fight, I'm going to really step up. I've been working my ass off, and I've been going to sleep and waking up um, angry to get back in the cage and 
you know, put on a performance and show people what I'm about. Yeah, man, I can't wait to see you in there again, mate. It's so close that last fight. But what what were you? I, I, I've got to stay neutral, so I can't say my opinion. I know. But I can. <laughs> but, um, but what what were you thinking going into the going into the third round? I don't care. What I'm going to say it. I thought you you were pretty all right there, to be fair. But what yeah, did you feel definitely. going into the third? I felt like he'd lost the fight in his face. I could see it in his eyes. So I was just hunting him down in the third round. He was just throwing little shots and moving and and trying to stay out the way and. I was just the train coming forward and that's what he's seen and he didn't like. Um, and he was a lot more athletic than I thought. He was he was weaker than I thought because he was saying that I'd had no chance of pinning him against the gauge, which everyone does um, until we get a grip, until I get a grip of them. Um, a lot of people were questioning whether I'd be able to do what I've done in MMA at middleweight and at light heavyweight. And I proved that, you know, James Mullerin, Although he's not the biggest heavyweight, he, you know, no heavyweight was pinning him against the cage. He even fought in the UFC against James Willis, didn't he? Yeah. Um, you know, James Willis couldn't keep him down. And, you know, he's a big dude. So for me to be able to pin James Mullerin against the cage for the full fight and beat him up, um, and same with Carl Moore, and he was cage what he's light heavyweight champion, um, you know, there's no one being out there to compete against me strength yet. Strength and fitness and conditioning. Um, and my ring craft. A lot of people don't realise. You see the cage control and they think, oh, he's just, he's just boring there and stuff like that. But what they don't realise is there's an IQ to it. And there's a very high level of conditioning. Because it's like, you know, the sledge pushes. It's you the know? most grueling part of the sport, they say, isn't it? Pushing it up is. I mean, trying to keep someone against the cage is no joke. It's not easy. It's easier to step up and move around and have a little box. Um, but, un- but unfortunately for me, that's when I get my face punched. Because <laughs> I'm always going against longer <laughs> fighters. So every chance I get, I'm in, I'm grabbing, I'm dirtying it up, I'm turning it into a dog fight. Because that's where my game is on the inside. So before I interrupt you, you were about to say something about a sledge pool or something like that. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, like, people, you see people pushing sledges, don't you, with weights on, running up and down the gym with sledges. That's the sort of conditioning you need to keep someone against the cage. But imagine doing that with a 100-kilo sledge for five minutes non-stop. One minute rest, five minutes non-stop, one minute rest. People can't do it. But what I always do, people don't know this, but before every fight, I, I, I've got an X3, BMW X3. It's not quite the X5, but it's a 4x4. Four four. Um, and I push that um, for 15 minutes when I'm fighting do? non-stop. <laughs> I, do, I do push it for a kilometre um, in 15 minutes on the dock road in Liverpool, which is one straight long road. Um, I have my missus in the front, just sitting in the front, doing a makeup or whatever. And then I'll just push the car for 15 minutes because I know if I can keep pushing it, two-ton car for 15 minutes um, that I, that no matter what I can pin a human being against the cage and beat him up for 15 minutes if I have to exactly and say and, and doing damage to the guy against the cage at the same time as well and well for everyone out there if your car breaks down um, give Lee a chat you're cool he'll happily tow you home <laughs> back, he'll manually tow you home you know just run your only if, if you're 15 well, minutes away <laughs> well, I said to me, missus, the other day, I said, listen, I really need to get out and push my car. I feel, I feel like I'm, I need to push my car. And she went, well, what if the police stop you because of this coronavirus and that? And I went, well, one, I'm allowed out for an hour for exercise. And right. two, I'll just say I've got a flat tire or, or my car's broke down, so I'm pushing it. <laughs> Quality. Well, they said you can't travel to go to exercise somewhere. And they, and they said you can't drive unnecessarily, but you're not driving, you're training, you're pushing your car. There's nothing That's illegal it, about exactly. that. Nothing wrong with that. And I, to be honest, I don't think the I think the police would just laugh if they see me. I don't think they'd want to tell me off for doing a bit of fitness and pushing the car for 15 minutes. I think well, they'd think that was a bit crazy. Well, if they know if they know who you are, mate, if they think, geez, he can push that for 15 minutes, you see him fight in the cage, they'll be calling back up, mate, because what they're going to do, yeah. hold you against the floor. It's not going to happen, is it? You know, so. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Definitely not. 
<laughs> Quite a, you watch how many vocals you get now from Lee Chadwick breakdown service, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you, I might get some business cards going after this COVID nineteen. <laughs> That's quality, mate. Uh, that's made me laugh. So, obviously, talking about COVID nineteen, we're we're stuck in this situation. We're obviously all in lockdown for another three weeks now. But what's fantastic to see is that you still have the opportunity to be able to go to a gym of yours, you know, without social, still with social distancing and stuff like that now. So, like, how much? Yeah. Is, how much of an advantage has that been for you, you know, during this time? Well, it's great because I've got spin bikes in here. So, that, like this morning, I've done some weights, um, just half an hour weights. I've done 20 minutes intervals on the spin bike, just fast blasts to get my heart rate into the red zone. Um, and, like, later on, I might go on a jog or something like that. So, yeah, I'm able to stay fit every day. It's keeping me focused. Um, a, lot of me, a lot of my friends around me are getting pissed every day. So you know, I'm, this is my this is my drug that I'm using to keep me going and keep me keep me sane during this time. Well, yeah, well, it's obviously really important to stay fit and healthy for obvious reasons. But but generally, you know, this it probably won't be. But let's say this gets lifted in a month's time and events start coming on again, you want to be fight ready, don't you? The minute they say right, fights are ready to go. Well, definitely. As soon as this gets lifted, then um, Bellator start announcing dates. I I want to be first in line. Um, I'm, I'm ready yesterday I could take a fight I, I like to train 80% all the time so I like to know that if I need to I can take a fight in a week or two notice and just have a couple of days of stepping it up because it, it has happened in, in the past I got offered a fight five days before um, uh, against Alessio Sicara in Italy yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I took the fight um, to be honest with you <laughs> Uh, between, between, well, it's not between us because it's going on man. Um, but I, I was out actually out that weekend on a Saturday night, and then I was hung over in bed on a Sunday when I got the phone call. But I was fit. I was training, fight training up till that night out. After constantly fit, and then I just had a little blowout. I was in bed and I got a phone call. I didn't answer it. It was my manager. Then my coach phoned me. I didn't answer it because my head was in the shed. And then I got a text <laughs> message. A text message off of, off my coach saying, I know you've been out, but just letting you know you've been off the fight in Italy against Alessio Sicara. So if you want to get in the gym and sweat out for five days, you can take that fight. And I went, yeah, two rights, fuck okay. So on the Monday, I was on the assault bike. Do you know the assault bike that nope. everyone's using now? It's a hand and it's hands and legs. So it's a bike with oh, hands yeah. and legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm with it's you. really yeah. intense. So Monday morning. Got up, went in the gym, he had my couch coach um, shouting down my ear, killing me on that, just going all out, trying to sweat everything out of me, on the pads, shark tanking me, beasted me um, for two days, and then the fight got like cancelled. Well, he took a, um, he turned down the fight and took a lesser opponent, as you've seen in Italy. Um, he, he, he just back, went through that opponent like a train, um, which I was a bit disappointed because I would have been, he would have got me. Not at my best time, um, so he should have been taking his his level, his, his calibre. He should be fighting people like me. He shouldn't be fighting people like Pico. Yeah, um, he's only had eight fights. He should have fought me. But um, I think the use, I was used as a battle, and when the other guy was going to do it, they give give him him instead. Not to mention it makes good business because he wouldn't have got paid as much as me to fight him. So um, yeah, but I was gutted because I wanted that because he's a name. Alessio Sicard is a big name in Italy. Name. He was in the UFC, he's in Bellator, he's a top guy. So, yeah, I wanted that fight. I was hungry for that. Um, but maybe further down the line, next time we're in Italy, I'll be more than happy to fly over and fight him. I did comment on this post saying, um, <laughs> I commented on this post saying, where did you find that opponent in the, in the supermarket? <laughs> back to me, so, yeah, a bit, bit disrespectful, but I was a bit annoyed that. He turned me down for him. Yeah, man. You know, true, true, warrior, true warrior spirit. You want to be fighting the best, don't you? Well, I'll tell you, I can't bit him in the arse in the end, though, because um, he tried to... Ken Coppola, another guy I speak to quite a lot, he's in your division as well. He went over to Italy. They thought, oh, he's nice. And he dropped the guy in the first round, I think it was. You he know, and did, yeah. He him with a good swing. I see in that fight, yeah. Ken Cooperman, K. Oldham. He's doing well, Ken. He fought to Melvin Manoff. That went the distance, didn't it? 
Uh, yeah, went the distance, and he because I I've actually interviewed um, him on the show as well, um, Kent, and yeah, he, he took some of the hardest shots that Melvin's ever thrown, and actually stayed like got back up again, sort of thing. And then he recently won his last fight, just gone as well. But um, that could be an interesting matchup for you too, because he's he's a good grappler as well, good boxer. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, and I have tried to get him in the past, to be honest with you. So that would be good. And I do believe he's a bit of a underrated fighter. He's not big on social media or something. So. Not many people have heard of him, but he's a top guy. Like he can hang with the best. Oh yeah, for um, sure, mate. And, and he like fought, he fought Andy Manzolo, didn't he? Yeah, he beat Did him he? with um, he beat him. Yeah, yeah. His last fight yeah. was Manzolo. Yeah. Yeah, that was, was his last terrible fight? fight for Manzolo. Yeah, it was his last fight. Yeah, he beat him by um, submission, I think. Yeah, because he, he destroyed Manzolo's legs and then he just yeah, put a forearm over the throat. Him. He forearmed him yeah. on the throat and he tapped out from that, I think, didn't he? Yeah, well, Andy Manzolo's problem is he fights someone, gives himself a test, and then he goes away and fights about five bums. Then he'll come back and have a test, and he'll go, and he's all about the record. You know, at the end of the day, records are for DJs. As you can see with Andy Manzolo, he's got a brilliant record. But if you look at everyone he's fought and beat, he hasn't really, you know, every time he comes up against someone good like myself and Ken Cooperman, he gets found out. And that's just down to not believing in himself. Because if you believed in yourself, you wouldn't be going around fighting all those bombs. Exactly, man. Oh, I can see the kids get. Before I let you go, because I can hear the kids obviously. It's all right. he's, he's, he's going to the toilet. Just need to move the door for him. Go on, mate. That's right. Now, as I say, just before I, just before I let you go, mate, as well, I just want to quickly ask. Um, I'm sure you've been asked a million times. When did the who gave you this? Who gave you the nickname? Where did the butcher first originate from? Um, it was a friend of mine called Mark Scanlon. Who was in the UFC from Calbon. Yeah. And um, I got sponsored. My uncle's got a butcher's. So I got sponsored by him. It said Chadwick's Butchers. Chadwick's my second name. So um, he was like, ah, the butcher, that suits you. And just through my style of uh, style in the gym, the way I was, I was aggressive and violent. Um, when I first started out, when I used to spar, I used to spar at 120%. So they gave me that nickname because they think it suited me. <laughs> Quality, mate. No, it's nice. You know, I was trying to work out what it could be. Is, is he used to chop meat up? Did he, you know what I mean? Was he related to Pat Butcher? I don't know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, yeah. no, mate. It's always interesting to see where they originate from, mate. And um, everyone's got a different story. You could easily call yourself the pit bull like every other person's done. You know what I mean? But you don't have I to know, call yourself it. different. That's it, mate. Oh. Well, I tell you what, mate, thank you very much um, for taking time to have a chat. I know you're training at the moment. You've got the kids getting them involved with training, which is great as well, you know, keeping them busy. And just want to give you opportunity to give a shout out to anyone, you know, help you get to where you are today. Any sponsors, you know, anything like that? Yeah, well, I'd like to say thanks to all the people around me, the people who support me. They know who they are. Um, I've had a supplements company that sponsored me from day one, 14 years. Um, so that's PNI Supplements. Um, he's a good friend of mine, and I appreciate that. I've got uh, the gyms that all help me out, like um, Unit 7 Fitness. That's where I do my ASW training, my fight training. Uh, there's Four Corners Gym in Liverpool. My own business is called Heat Camps. Um, and my missus's business, Angels and Energies. She does all like meditation and um, positive thinking and stuff like that. So that works well with me. She does a lot of that with me. Um, and that's good time. Fight good time to be doing that now as well meditating and stuff because there's not a lot to do so no that's probably a good thing for people to check out yeah that's it and and, and most of all me coaching teammates um, coach teammates and family me coach Darren Morris all the lads at ASW and all my family around me that support me during fight camp so yeah just I want to thank everyone that's around me right now and don't forget and your new business my management right. team and Bellator <laughs> <laughs> there's always someone that you forget you come off and you go oh, I didn't say them I didn't say them but yeah my management team as well um, Heavy Duty and Bellator for the opportunity to fight on this stage because I really am like it is it is the organisation I wanted to go with due to the, 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 the way they look after the fighters the, the purses they pay fighters when, when you show your worth and um, they, get, they also let you get, get your opportunities in the grapple stage outside as well so yeah, um, I just love the organisation right now, and I'm on my second contract, so I'm hoping to make an impression with my next four fights. 
Nice, mate. And again, it's nice, obviously, great that Bellator are investing so much money into the European series as well. Like, so they're really pushing the UK, especially really, really pushing the UK and Ireland at the moment, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've just got me, um, well, I, I got it like a few, good few months ago, uh, my visa, so I can fight in America now. So I'm open, you know, when this COVID um, comes comes to an end, um, that I'm going to get off opportunities to fly out. And, you know, I'm going to be in people's backyards again, but the Americans don't know me and, you know, the UK scene, I've, I've been at the top of the UK scene for years, so it'll be nice to get a shot in the American scene and, you know, people who just think I'm a, um, just a wrestler brawler and don't understand the fundamentals of what I bring to the sport, I'm looking forward to catching a few Americans that have given me shit on, online and um, let them know what the butcher is when he's got all the... That's it, man. I can't wait to see you out wrestle those Americans over there, man. It, finally, we need we need someone to go over there and do that for us, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and again, Lee, mate, I can't wait for this all to be um, all done and dusted so we can see you fighting in the cage again, mate. Hopefully it won't take Thank too you. long and look forward to seeing you at the event. Oh, it's great. It's been great speaking to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Cheers, Lee, mate. Have a good day, mate. Take care.